Good morning, everyone. Uh, Mark Crowther, Chair of the Department of Medicine. Um, welcome to Chair's Grand Rounds. I'm just going to give uh, Zoom a few minutes to bring people in. We have uh, audience members joining us. Uh, Zoom takes a few minutes to have people join. So we'll give it another 30 seconds or so before we get started. Morning, everyone. We're just going to give another 15 seconds or so before we get started uh, and uh, look forward to today's presentation. Okay, um, we'll get started. So, good morning, everyone. Mark Crowther. I'm the chair of the Department of Medicine. Welcome to Chair's Grand Rounds uh, on a relatively cool spring morning. Um, and for those of you who've been around before, uh, same as usual, please ask questions in the question and answer function. Uh, if you use the chat function, I might miss it uh, because there tends to be a fair bit of stuff in the chat. Uh, we will hopefully finish with uh, lots of time for questions uh, for today's rounds. Uh, next week, we will restart regular um, physician chief staff, uh, chief cha uh, chair of the department, uh, chief of the Department of Medicine rounds at each of the sites. Uh, today's speaker is Dr. Brian Tripp, who's the Director of Biomedical Engineering and an Associate Professor at the University of Waterloo. Uh, and uh, it, the, his, his area of appointment is Systems Design Engineering, but we're talking today about um, neuroscience and artificial intelligence. I met Brian probably about a year ago uh, because we're establishing a strong relationship with a number of different programs at the University of Waterloo and their engineering uh, school. <clears throat> and the area of the interface between neurosciences <clears throat> and artificial intelligence is obviously one of huge interest. I, I said to Brian beforehand, most of the audience members are probably passingly familiar with this, but not confident enough in any of it to be able to talk about it. And I'm looking forward to a great presentation from Brian. Uh, if you have questions, again, please put them in the question and answer function, and I will rejoin you at the end of rounds. Go ahead, uh, Dr. Tripp. Okay, thank you, Dr. Crowther. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Um, I want to try something a little bit different, a, a bit of an experiment. Um, so I, I, uh, my understanding is there's a lot of interest in, in deep learning and in, uh, in the medical community. Um, uh, I've um, <clears throat> I've talked to um, a few doctors about about uh, deep learning and and uh, they seem to be full of ideas. Uh, and it seems to me that the uh, the longer we talk and the more we sort of get into the details of how deep learning works, uh, the more ideas come out and uh, and the more specific and creative the ideas are. Uh, so I developed an interest in. Uh, and helping uh, doctors to understand uh, how deep learning works. Um, now, the, the challenge here is that uh, normally this topic is approached uh, from, the, uh, from a sort of direction of, um, of math and programming, uh, which would work well enough for some doctors, but I gather not the majority. Uh, so I think it can also be approached from the direction of biology. Um, and we won't get to the same point, but I think we can get to a, um, you know, to a point of complementary uh, insights into deep learning from, uh, from a biological perspective. Uh, so I hope that works. Uh, this is my first time trying this out, uh, so I'm sure I won't get it quite right, uh, but I hope you appreciate the sentiment and I hope I can at least keep you entertained. <clears throat> um, okay, let's uh, just start off with a, a bit of motivation, uh, and this will be brief. Uh, you would know this much better than I would. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, but this is, um, this is sort of my caricature, I guess, of uh, clinical interest in deep learning. Um, firstly, physicians uh, are time, time stressed, uh, so I think there's a hope that deep learning can, uh, can offload some of the more routine tasks, um, particularly around interactions with uh, electronic medical records, uh, and free up time to sort of pay more attention to patients. Um, also, uh, um, access to specialists, uh, specialist opinions are often needed uh, before they're available or in, in places where they're not available. Uh, and so I think there's a hope that uh, deep networks, uh, maybe deep networks can be trained uh, to approximate specialists. And of course, it wouldn't be a very good approximation, uh, but there might be a way to get sort of a preliminary opinion uh, from a deep network uh, that is a, at least not, not too bad and, and useful enough to, to start to take action on uh, before the sort of official opinion comes in. Um, so let's just look at a couple of examples. Um, and I, I won't dwell on these for too long either. Um, but uh, one is, is uh, chest x-rays. There's been a lot of interest in this uh, subject in, in deep learning. Um, so chest x-rays uh, are used to, to detect ammonia. Uh, my, my impression uh, is that uh, many doctors can look at a chest x-ray and have a reasonable idea whether there's pneumonia or not, uh, but that to, get a, uh, to be really good at this, you have to be an expert, an experienced radiologist. 
Um, so there's been a lot of uh, a lot of interest uh, in in, uh, in, in um, training deep networks to uh, to approximate uh, the radiologist. Uh, and again, I think there's been some overconfidence in, in this area in the last few years. Uh, I, I don't think the hope I don't think the current hope is that uh, deep networks will be uh, sort of as good as radiologists uh, anytime soon at this. But um, but I, there is a hope that. Uh, um, you know, we can get part of the way there and, and get a preliminary assessment or, or at least maybe filter some of the, uh, the scans so that only the, the uh, more difficult, more ambiguous cases actually go to the radi radiologist, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so anyway, there's a, this is a, a, from a review paper. Um, a lot of studies uh, have been done in this area. These are, these are a few uh, that have achieved good results, a high sensitivity and specificity. Um, the caveat here is that uh, all of these results are, are retrospective, uh, so I don't think any of these systems have been validated in clinical practice. Although I, I did hear recently that there was a, uh, a system that achieved uh, regulatory clearance in the EU uh, to do something related. Um, okay, that's enough about that. Um, this is another system from the literature. Uh, it's, uh, it predicts many things, including uh, inpatient mortality risk uh, from electronic health record data. Uh, and this is an example. Um, this is sort of a timeline of the EHR data. Uh, and at this point, the, um, the system has predicted an elevated risk of mortality. Uh, and it, it's actually able to highlight the information in the EHR that's led to that prediction. That's the red stuff uh, over here. Um, now, I'm not sure, again, um, whether this system can detect anything that wouldn't already be obvious to a clinical team, uh, but there may be an opportunity here to, to uh, sort of prevent some patients from falling through the cracks. Um, okay, so that's just a couple of sort of uh, examples to, to uh, I guess, orient us. Um, there are lots of examples in the literature, uh, but I would sooner empower you to come up with your own examples. Um, so let's just dive into uh, a little bit about how, uh, how deep learning works. Uh, and we'll start off just at a high level uh, and look at this qualitatively. <clears throat> um, so this is what we would like out of a deep network. Um, so we'd like to put some information in uh, to the deep network and get an inference out. And the inference could be a diagnosis or it could be um, a prediction of length of stay or something like that. Uh, and we have to put in you know, relevant information. It could be images or medical record data. Um, and it has to be sort of enough information uh, to support the inference. Uh, we can't, you know, just put in uh, the patient's age and expect a diagnosis. So it has to be the, you know, the right information has to go in, but uh, we'd like the deep network to sort of do the work of, of that mapping. Uh, so this is what we start with. <clears throat> um, deep networks have to be trained. So we start out with an untrained deep network. Um, and deep networks uh, consist of a couple of things. They're defined by a structure, and the structure includes things like the number of layers in the network uh, and which layers are connected to each other. Uh, and then there are also numerical parameters, uh, a bunch of parameters. There are, in a, there are usually millions of parameters in a deep network, uh, but these are, these are all just numbers that sort of define the details of how the network works. Um, so as, as an analogy, uh, numerical parameters in a medication order might be things like, uh, well, uh, dose and, and frequency. Uh, so these are really important numbers. Uh, they have to be defined properly, uh, but we there's no way that deep networks are so uh, so complicated uh, that we can't uh, sort of define them in advance. Uh, so we start out uh, just assigning random numbers to all the parameters. Uh, so of course, uh, I should also mention actually the uh, the structure is a little bit different. We usually have uh, a pretty good idea what kinds of structures, uh, network structures, will be suitable for a, for a certain task. Uh, but the parameters uh, we don't know. Um, so this is how we start. Um, so if we, we have an untrained deep network, we put some information into it. Uh, and then we, of course, because the parameters are random, uh, we'll get an incorrect inference. <clears throat> um, so the usual way forward from this uh, is, uh, is uh, called supervised learning. Uh, supervised learning involves labeled data. Uh, so labeled data consists of examples of, of correct inferences. So um, information, uh, just pairs of, sort of information and the corresponding correct inference. Uh, so this could be the specialist opinion or it could be a gold standard invasive test. Um, but there's a, we need a lot of examples uh, uh, that we're, we have with the, uh, the, the image or whatever it is, uh, the medical records, the lab results and the, and the correct inference uh, uh, that we'd like the network to produce. Um, so we put uh, the information into the untrained deep network. And of course, it's, uh, it's got random parameters, so it gives us garbage. Um, and then the next step is to calculate something that is called a cost. Uh, the cost is a single number, and the cost is higher 
uh, when the difference between these two things is larger. Uh, so the, the wronger this is uh, compared to this, the higher the cost. Uh, here's an example. Uh, so if we had a, a x-ray, um, and we're trying to detect pneumonia, um, um, you know, this is a clean x-ray. So the corresponding, this is a, you know, one example of, uh, uh, from a labeled data set. A uh, labeled data set would have uh, you know, probably tens of thousands or more examples. Um, so we have uh, this clean example, uh, and we have to, you know, we have a, a label, we call it, that, uh, that uh, says it's not pneumonia. Um, and deep networks have to deal in numbers. They can only output numbers. Uh, so if we, if we want to express the idea that uh, there's no pneumonia in this uh, x-ray, uh, we have to do something like this. Um, so we have uh, three categories we're interested in distinguishing. Um, so we have to get the network to produce three numbers. And we want the, the number that corresponds to not pneumonia, in this case, to be a one, and the other ones to be a zero. Uh, so this is what we want the network to produce. And if it does produce this, we can just say, okay, this one's uh, <clears throat> this number is highest, so that means not pneumonia. The network thinks not pneumonia. Um, anyway, so this is the answer we want. Uh, suppose we get this answer. Uh, it's just a random answer because the parameters are random. Uh, so we can compare these two numbers and, and uh, get a cost. And the more different these are, the higher the cost is. Um, and then we use the cost to figure out how to change things. Um, so we can just look at, uh, you know, this, I've, I've drawn arrows going backwards. Uh, this is sort of meant to indicate that we use the cost to figure out, uh, first of all, how we should change the inference to reduce the cost. Um, so for example, uh, just looking at these two, uh, we can see to, to make these numbers more like this, we would want to make this one smaller. Uh, we'd want to make this one a lot smaller and we should make this one bigger. Um, so we can do that. We can compare these two numbers and, and figure out what changes or how we have to, what direction we have to change all these in uh, to, uh, to make them better. Uh, then given that knowledge, uh, we can figure out how to change the parameters of the network uh, to make the change in the inference that we need. And so I'll come back to that in a bit more detail later on, but that's the basic idea. Uh, we give uh, uh, an example. We have a labeled data set with a bunch of examples with correct answers. Um, and we just pre present the, uh, the input from a labeled example to the network. It gives us uh, garbage, and then we quantify how, how bad the garbage is. And then we, uh, we do some calculations to figure out how to change the network's output and change the network itself uh, to make the answer better. Now, we can't make the change all at once um, uh, because, uh, well, because the, the estimate of, uh, of how to change the network is, uh, is really only valid for you know, um, the, you know, the way that the network is right now. Uh, so we can't make large changes that sort of bring us out of that, uh, that range too quickly. Uh, but we can make a little change um, every time, every time we see an example to make the network better and better. And so there's nothing fancy going on. We just do that millions of times. Uh, we just present an, an example of the network, uh, calculate the cost, change the network a little bit, and just do it again, millions and millions of times. Uh, and if it goes well, then we end up in a place where uh, the cost doesn't go to zero, but it gets very small. Uh, and most of the time, then, uh, the network is producing correct inferences. Now, that's basically how you train a deep network. <clears throat> uh, now, it's important to recognize that the situation depicted here uh, isn't the least bit useful. Uh, so we've got the, our information from our labeled data set uh, going into the deep network. It's producing the correct inference. Uh, but of course, we already had the correct inference in this case because it was part of the labeled data. You know, we've, we've done the expensive test or, or whatever the situation is. Uh, so this isn't useful at all. Uh, and it, it seems maybe uh, subtle, but it's really important uh, what we need the network to do is uh, is to produce correct inferences on uh, data that it hasn't seen yet. Uh, where you know cases where we don't we haven't done the test or we don't want to do the test. We're not we're not sure if we want to do the test. Uh, so this is what we need deep networks to do, um, and they don't always do that. It doesn't always work. Um, so we have to be uh, we have to pay a lot of attention um, to we have to try to you know take special steps to encourage the deep networks to generalize. Uh, and we also always have to test whether they have actually generalized uh, beyond the data that they were trained on. And sometimes they don't. Um, so, you know, one way that a deep network uh, can sort of learn to reduce the cost uh, against the training data uh, is, is to um, memorize uh, subtle examples or subtle details of the, of the training examples. Uh, so that will happen if we don't uh, sort of take steps to avoid it. And it always will happen to some extent. You know, so we have to be careful to measure how much it's happened. Uh, okay, so that's the high level overview. Uh, let's just kind of zoom in a little bit more. Um, into the network itself. Um, so I have a sketch of a artificial neuron. <clears throat> They're very simple things uh, compared to real neurons, especially. 
so this is the neuron here. There, there are some inputs to the neuron. Uh, I've just drawn five of them and labeled them I1 to I5. Uh, in real networks, there would be many more. Um, and the, the, network, the neuron has uh, one output, which I'm calling O. And it's just one output, but it branches to uh, many other neurons. Uh, so the, the single output goes and becomes the input uh, to, to neurons that are later on in the network. Uh, and the, um, the function of the neuron is so simple uh, that I'm just going to write the equation for it. This will be the only equation I, I uh, show in the slides today. Uh, but here it is. Uh, so it's essentially just a, the output is essentially just a weighted sum of the inputs. Uh, so each input is uh, multiplied by a corresponding weight. Uh, so you can kind of look at the weights as being associated with these uh, these arrows, uh, these connections. Um, so uh, you know this one I one is multiplied by W one. Uh, that happens in, in all these uh, for all these inputs, and then they're all added together. And then we just add one more number, which we call a bias, uh, and that's uh, weighted sum plus a bias. That's pretty much the output. The only other detail is that uh, we just restrict that to be zero or more. Uh, so if, if all of this, the weighted sum of all these uh, inputs plus the bias, if, if that's greater than zero, then that becomes the output. Uh, if it's less than zero, then we just set it to zero, and that's it. And we call that rectification. So this is a particular kind of artificial neuron. It's called a rectified linear unit, uh, but it's the most common kind of uh, neuron in, used in deep learning. Um, <clears throat> okay, back to the network. Uh, so the, I mentioned before that the deep networks can only deal in numbers. Um, so the, uh, the outputs uh, of the deep network will be numbers and we have to sort of set the problem up so that uh, numbers are gonna mean something uh, useful. Uh, the input also has to be numbers. Uh, so, and these are, you know, so both these have to be lists of numbers essentially. You know, so this could be you know, lists of uh, vital signs or lab results uh, or images or lists of numbers too. Uh, each pixel in an image, uh, each pixel in a black and white image would be the uh, uh, a number uh, that defines the brightness of the of the pixel. Uh, if we want to encode, uh, if we want to input something like a, a note, then we have to convert that into a list of numbers too. And there are there are good ways to do that. Uh, so we have our, our numbers to put in, uh, and then this is a, a sketch of what's going on inside the network. Um, so all the inputs are are sent to uh, a, a layer of layer of neurons. Uh, so the neurons are organized in layers within the network. Uh, so this would be the first layer of neurons. Uh, that receives the inputs. Uh, the outputs of this layer of neurons become the inputs for the next layer, and so on until the output. Um, I should say this is a this is as much network as I had the patience to draw. Um, a real network, uh, or a typical this could be a real network, but a typical deep network would uh, would have dozens of layers and, and uh, potentially millions of neurons. But it's the same idea basically. Uh, there are other you know sometimes there are other sort of fancy things like sometimes you know this layer might connect to this one over here. Uh, as well as just uh, directly through the sort of hierarchy of network of layers. Uh, but uh, essentially, they're just a, a bunch of neurons that are connected uh, more or less in series. <clears throat> uh, and this is just to highlight the connections of one of the neurons in the network. Uh, so again, uh, if, we're, if we're doing... Um, Supervised learning. We're training the network using supervised learning, which involves the uh, providing the correct answer. <clears throat> uh, then, when we when we uh, feed information to the network, it propagates forward and produces an inference. The inference uh, has some associated cost, uh, and then, as I said, we use the cost to figure out how to improve the network. So, just a little bit more detail on that. Um, that process is called uh, back propagation. <clears throat> Uh, and uh, I'm illustrating it by just drawing all the arrows backwards. Um, so this is this is done immediately after the information from the input has propagated forward through the network. We've calculated the cost, and then we're using that cost. Uh, we want to figure out how to use that cost uh, to improve the uh, the network and make it work better, reduce the cost. Um, so this information that's flowing backwards is a little bit different. Um, it's not the outputs of the neurons, um, but it's, it's um, actually, so this information in, in particular flowing from here to here uh, is, the, um, <clears throat> is the dependence of the cost on this, on this value, on this output value. So that's fed back to here, and that's used to calculate how the cost would change uh, with a small change in the output of this neuron. And that is, uh, is fed back and used to calculate how the cost would change uh, if we made a small change to this weight and also this weight and this weight and this weight. Um, and so this information, uh, so that this actually tells us how to change the weight. We want to change the weight to reduce the cost. 
Uh, so this information like that is propagated backward through the network. Uh, and that gives us, uh, you know, when, when we're done, it gives us an estimate of how to change all the weights of the network, each of the weights of the network in order to bring the cost down. Uh, that information is, uh, is called the gradient. Um, so we, we say that back propagation, uh, this, this, this algorithm is sort of you know, calculating certain things at each node and then propagating backwards. Uh, that, is, uh, that gives us the gradient, or the gradient of the, of the cost. To, this is a, a term from calculus, the gradient of the cost with respect to the, uh, the weights. Um, and, and then we have, once we have the gradient, we do something called gradient descent, which is you know, it's very simple. We just, uh, we, you know, we, we just change all the weights a little bit using the gradient uh, to bring the cost down. But just bring the cost down a little bit. Uh, if we if we go too far, then we uh, we we end up uh, the you know the estimate of the, the gradient becomes invalid, and we uh, we make the network worse potentially. But we take a little bit of, of a step uh, to make, bring the cost down, and we just do that a lot of times. Um, okay, and that's basically it. That's my my brief qualitative overview of uh, of, uh, of deep learning. Uh, so with engineers, we normally go from that point into uh, the math and uh, and the uh, programming examples. Uh, but we're going to try something different. Um, so I want to talk about first the similarities between deep networks and the brain uh, to give a, a bit of a biological grounding and also the differences. Um, and uh, this is not an exhaustive list by any means, but I'll just uh, go through some of these uh, sort of fairly quickly. Um, so starting out with, uh, with neurons, um, one similarity is that information flows uh, through neurons in one direction during inference. So we just talked about back propagation. Uh, that isn't something that's uh, biologically uh, has a as a biological uh, uh, counterpart. Um, but uh, but during inference, uh, when information is flowing forward through the network, uh, that's analogous. You know, in that case, as I showed from the equation, uh, the output of a neuron is uh, depends on the inputs and not vice versa. Uh, so similarly, in, in uh, biological neurons, uh, action potentials uh, travel from the cell body to the synaptic terminals, and um, neurotransmitters are released and, and travel from presynaptic to postsynaptic cells. Uh, so it's a one-directional uh, communication. Another similarity, we talked about how the uh, output of an artificial neuron is uh, related to the sum of the inputs. Uh, that's more or less the case uh, sometimes in biological neurons. Uh, this is a sort of textbook illustration of that. Um, the idea is that uh, you know, a single input to a neuron doesn't do much, uh, but if you have multiple inputs uh, that are close together in time, then their influences sum and, and maybe produce an action potential. Uh, and finally, um, like the outputs of artificial neurons, um, well, I should say the, the artificial neurons uh, produce uh, real numbers. So they produce you know, things like 2.37. Uh, that's, that's what their output looks like. Uh, of course, biological neurons uh, produce spikes. Uh, and there's uh, a lot of discussion in neuroscience about what the spikes mean. Uh, but the, most of the information that they convey is in the, is in the rate of spiking. Uh, and the rate can't be less than zero. You can't have less than zero spikes, obviously, in a, in a certain time interval. Uh, so in, in that sense, uh, there's, that's, uh, that's the similarity. They're both, uh, these are, they, both these outputs are rectified um, in, in, that, uh, in that way. Um, okay, moving up to uh, the network level, a few other similarities. Um, so like cortical neurons, and it, it varies, you know, different neurons in the brain uh, have different numbers of inputs, but in, in the cortex, in the human cortex, for example, uh, pyramidal cells have about 20,000 uh, inputs. <clears throat> and it's a similar story in, in, the, in deep networks. Uh, so a large deep network, uh, a neuron uh, might receive uh, several thousand inputs. Um, so, um, and the numbers vary in each case, uh, but, um, you know, qualitatively, uh, in each case, there's a, there's a very substantial convergence of information onto uh, single neurons. Uh, another commonality is that learning involves changes in synaptic strength. Uh, so these are in the in the deep network, it's uh, it's really simple. The strength of the synaptic connection is just the weight uh, that I showed you before, uh, and these these change uh, during the the learning process. Uh, but similarly, the um, uh, changes in synaptic strength, uh, long term potentiation and depression, uh, are also underlie learning in biological uh, neural networks. Uh, this one's a bit more specific, uh, but neurons in uh, convolutional networks, uh, which are convolutional networks, are a widely used uh, kind of deep network, uh, very useful for image processing. Um, in those networks, uh, the neurons in a, in a layer don't receive inputs from all the neurons in the previous layer. They receive inputs only from a few neurons in sort of a localized region of the previous layer uh, that is responsive to a certain part of the image. Um, and likewise, this is analogous to, uh, to neurons in the visual cortex of, uh, of animals. Uh, for example, in, the, in, the, uh, in V2, area V2, 
uh, neurons don't receive input from uh, all of the neurons in the primary visual cortex, just a small minority that correspond, they, they sort of are responsive to, uh, to inputs or to, to visual stimuli in a certain part of the visual field. Uh, so in each case, you end up with, uh, with a receptive field, uh, which is a small part of either the image uh, that's fed into the network or the visual scene uh, that's fed into the eyes uh, that, is, that a given neuron in the visual cortex will be responsive to, or, or the deep network. Uh, and the receptive fields in each case also get larger as you go deeper into the network. Um, there are also similarities in internal activity in the brain and, uh, and deep networks. <clears throat> um, the finding here um, is that if you train a deep network to do something that uh, is done in part of the brain, uh, for example, if you train uh, the, the primate ventral visual stream, uh, including the human ventral visual stream, uh, is involved in, in, uh, in image recognition, a recognition of, of objects, categorization of objects uh, uh, that are seen, um, and if there's damage, uh, uh, that can lead to visual agnosia. Um, so if you train um, a deep network to do the same thing, essentially, uh, to, do, to recognize uh, categories of, of objects or images, uh, then it turns out um, the internal activity of the network, uh, so you know, the, the outputs of all the neurons that are within the network at, at different layers of the network, uh, those become very good predictors of activity of real uh, neurons in the primate brain, in the primate visual, ventral visual stream. Uh, and it is a, a, a close correspondence where you know, neurons in earlier layers of the, of the deep network will, will uh, be better predictors of neurons in earlier layers of the uh, earlier areas of the primate ventral visual stream uh, and uh, neurons in later layers will predict uh, um, uh, deeper uh, neuron, the activity of deeper neurons in the, in the, in the uh, ventral visual stream, uh, an area in, in the uh, infratemporal cortex, for example. Um, so, um, and this, is, this has been found in multiple brain areas. Um, and I should say this, this is, uh, the predictions are far from perfect, uh, but they're actually the best predictions we have. There are no, there's no other sort of uh, mathematical model that can give us uh, um, better estimates of what the brain activity will be uh, in response to a certain, uh, a certain image. And similar results have been found in other brain systems, including uh, the, the grasping uh, network uh, and also language areas. Uh, there are also similarities in function, um, and it has to be said, I think, that uh, among artificial systems, there are no other artificial systems that behave as much like humans as deep networks do. Uh, and in fact, often if you train a, a, a deep network to do a, a narrow task, a specific task, uh, then in that, within that narrow task, the deep network will perform uh, as well as, uh, as a human, uh, sometimes an expert human. Uh, but I have a few examples here, uh, and I've uh, sort of deliberately avoided uh, medical examples because uh, I didn't want to get into a fight about it. Uh, but some of these are really interesting. Um, the, uh, this one in particular, I think, so this is Raven's progressive matrices. This is a kind of uh, well-established intelligence test. Um, and uh, deep networks do, certain deep networks do really well at, at this. Uh, so if you've, if you've done this test, it's a, it's a test that doesn't require any sort of education or experience, uh, but it's challenging. If you, if you, uh, if you try to, uh, if you, you can look up examples on, online, I think, um, you know, you, if, you, if you try to complete the, uh, the progressive uh, matrix, uh, it, it feels like it's sort of, you know, exercising your intelligence and, you know, you might not be uh, smart enough to get the answer right. Uh, but deep networks uh, do quite well. Uh, so that's, uh, I'm not sure what it means, but that's uh, it's at least uh, interesting. There are also, of course, lots of differences between deep networks and uh, sorry, deep networks in the brain. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> this is um, I, I said before uh, that um, in uh, in biological neurons, sometimes uh, the uh, sometimes the two inputs are combined, uh, sort of like. Uh, Sort of like a sum, uh, like a like an artificial neuron. Uh, that's a that's a great uh, simplification, though. Um, so it's not when there are two inputs uh, nearby on a dendritic tree, uh, their their influence on the on the uh, output of the neuron on the, on, on firing uh, doesn't really sum. Uh, what sums is is something more specific. It's the uh, it's the conductance to a certain ion uh, in a certain part of the cell membrane. Um, so, which could have uh, either you know, the, the effects uh, on firing uh, could be either greater or less than the sum of the individual effects. Uh, so the, the situation in, in real neurons is just uh, vastly more complicated. 
Sometimes it's roughly a sum, but uh, often it's not. Uh, so that's a, that's a difference, basically. <clears throat> uh, biological neurons also have uh, internal dynamics, uh, things like uh, adaptation and dendritic spiking. Um, so the, uh, the influence of an input to a neuron uh, doesn't only reflect the output right away. It can also, refer, it can also affect the output, uh, so you know, tens or even hundreds of milliseconds into the future. Uh, and that does not happen at all in, in uh, deep networks. Uh, at the network level, um, in the cortex, uh, in contrast with, with deep networks, uh, the vast majority of connections are very local. So they're between two neurons that are, that are uh, very close together physically and part of the same uh, brain area, cortical area. Uh, whereas in, in deep networks, uh, most deep networks completely lack that kind of connection, uh, which again are the majority in the brain. Uh, and in, in uh, all deep networks, there's a focus on feed forward connections, which are the ones I drew before, the, you know, the, the connections from one layer to the next layer to the next layer. Uh, the analogy would be, uh, you know, connections from one uh, visual area to the next visual area. <clears throat> um, even if you only consider the feed forward structures, uh, there are differences in the details. Um, so this is a depiction of, uh, of a, a uh, widely used uh, convolutional network uh, called the inception network. Uh, and this is, this figure uh, means that you know this this axis uh, is the source layers, and these are the target layers, uh, and the the colors of these uh, little squares indicate the connection strength. Uh, so the beginning of the network is over here, and it's very simple. Uh, you know each source layer is connected to the next layer uh, with uh, with high density um, for several layers, and there's some more sort of detail later on. Um, so a few years ago. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, a few years ago, I I, uh, I wondered sort of how different uh, this was from uh, from the brain. Uh, so I developed a convolutional network um, that had uh, that was closely based on uh, based on a lot of uh, data from macaque uh, monkey visual cortex, including uh, detailed uh, uh, tracer injection data uh, and lots of other sources of data. Uh, and I, I developed a convolutional network that closely reflects the uh, the structure of the uh, macaque visual cortex, which is similar to human visual cortex. Uh, and the details, uh, uh, the number of layers is not that different uh, when you add everything out, uh, but the details of the connections are just entirely uh, unrelated. Uh, so the macaque structure looks more like this. Uh, and of course, uh, most of the brain is missing from deep networks. Um, so the uh, a lot of uh, sort of image processing networks are, are you know if you, they're most closely analogous to this pathway here, uh, the ventral visual pathway from V1 to infratemporal cortex, uh, and um, you know there's a there's a there's much more brain. Uh, so even even those networks, even a large network that uh, were to closely approximate this part of the brain, uh, would be missing the dorsal visual areas, uh, somatosensory areas, motor areas. Prefrontal areas, of course, which are uh, we would uh, probably associate more closely with intelligence than the visual cortex, and anything subcortical. So there's no basal ganglia, no hippocampus, no cerebellum. Uh, so most of the brain is not there. <clears throat> okay, so let's talk about the differences. Uh, uh, in, in function, I mean. Um, so the um, <clears throat> um, there there are a few there are a lot of important differences in, in the behavior of uh, of uh, deep networks versus the brain. Uh, one of them that's that's uh, uh, received a lot of attention um, in the, in the deep learning community is the, is this idea of adversarial inputs. Uh, so so it's easy to fool deep networks. Uh, this is an example here. So this is a, an image processing network again. Um, th this is a, an image of a uh, of a whale. And the network has correctly classified this as a whale, uh, but it's possible to change the image very slightly, uh, and it, it's so slightly, in fact, that a human can't tell the difference. Uh, but the, and it, the change has to be very specific, so it's calculated specifically to have this effect. Uh, but you can make a very slight change, and that will force the network to to misclassify it. In this case, as a turtle, uh, even though uh, as a human, uh, I, I've stared at these for a while, I can't see any difference between them. Um, deep networks also um, make decisions using different cues than humans do. Um, and another image processing example, uh, image uh, recognition networks, uh, it was found a few years ago, uh, rely largely on textures, uh, which is, uh, and they tend to ignore shapes, uh, which is the opposite of the way humans uh, recognize images. Uh, so in this case, if it, this is a texture of an Indian elephant, and the, uh, the network says it's an elephant, so that's right. It recognizes this picture of a cat. Uh, but if you combine the shape of a cat with the texture of an elephant, 
uh, a human, any human would, would look at this and see a cat. I mean, this, this head especially is sort of unmistakable as a cat head, uh, but the network thinks it's an elephant. Uh, so that's just a, a difference. Um, deep networks also struggle with out of distribution data. Um, so you know, if you, if you give, the, give the network a bunch of examples, there's some uh, from some kind of a statistical uh, distribution, which may not be well defined. But it's a, you know, if you if you're giving it images of, of uh, objects as they tend to appear in the world, uh, then it will learn to do a good job categorizing objects as they appear in the world, like this one. Uh, but then totally fail uh, if if you uh, change the configuration of the object. Um, so, for example, these these numbers I should say are the confidence of the network. Uh, so in this case, the network is entirely sure that this is a punching bag, uh, even though any human would recognize it instantly as a bus. Um, and finally, deep networks, uh, if, they, if they're trained well, if, they, if they're working properly, they generalize from examples, but they do that without ever really making sense of, the, of how the world works. Uh, so this is an example from a, a network that generates text. Um, the input to the network is in italics, uh, and the network produces this bold text in response. Uh, so the, the, the talk text is so you provide this to the network. You're having a small dinner party. Uh, you want to serve dinner in the living room. The dining room table is wider than the doorway. So to get it into the living room, you will have to. Uh, and you know, you and I are probably thinking uh, you have to turn the table on its side or something like that. Uh, the network says remove the door. Uh, so that's that's a little sketchy. Yeah, but then it just uh, it just goes downhill from there. So it says you have a table saw. So you cut the door in half and remove the top half. Yeah, so this network is, is, is the best network in the world uh, for generating text, and it's, and it's impressively sy uh, syntactically coherent. Uh, and it's sort of, you know, it sounds like, a, like, a, like human language, uh, but it's giving terrible advice. <clears throat> okay, so there are a lot of uh, similarities, uh, substantial similarities, and also uh, clearly substantial differences between deep networks and the brain. Um, so I want to take a few minutes to uh, talk about um, how to reduce the differences. Um, so, you know, we don't necessarily have to put up these differences and, and just sort of accept them and, and live in a world where these, these exist. Um, um, work in, in my lab and, uh, and others uh, is aimed at uh, sort of incorporating elements of the brain uh, to, to see if we can make deep networks uh, sort of less artificial in some ways. Um, <clears throat> so I mentioned before uh, that I had uh, a few years ago developed a convolutional network that was uh, a fairly close approximation of the uh, macaque monkey visual cortex. Um, so with collaborators, I, I did it again uh, with mouse visual cortex. Uh, and this is a good idea because uh, mice are, are more tractable. Uh, they're ultimately, I think they're ultimately easier to understand. Uh, but the, you know, they're still mammals. They have all the same parts as we do. Uh, the cortex, uh, basal ganglia, uh, cerebellum, all that stuff, uh, very similar cells in each structure. Uh, so if we're interested in really fundamentally understanding how, the, how a, mam a mammalian brain works um, uh, and uh, sort of, you know, uh, taking its secrets and, and uh, using them uh, in deep networks potentially, uh, then mice are, are probably a good place to start. Um, so we've, we've uh, developed this network, which we call MouseNet. Uh, and what we've been doing recently is uh, training the network with more realistic, more naturalistic inputs. Um, so there are a few steps involved. Uh, the, our, the first step uh, was to develop this uh, naturalistic meadow environment. Uh, this is a virtual environment uh, based on a video game engine. Uh, so it looks like this. Uh, this is uh, you know, an environment that a, mice, uh, a mouse might sort of wander around in uh, in, in real life. Uh, we've also modeled the optics of the mouse eye, which are really poor. Uh, mice, mice don't see well. Uh, so this is a, a, a frame, a binocular frame, the left eye and the right eye perspective. Uh, from the perspective of a mouse, uh, sort of close to the ground, uh, this is with clear vision. Uh, what the mouse would actually see is more like this. Uh, so this is they have uh, you know low resolution vision. Uh, everything's blurry. Uh, everything sort of farther than ten or fifteen centimeters away is, is blurry to a mouse. Uh, they don't see well. Uh, so th these are the frames that we actually will uh, will give to the mouse model. Uh, finally, we've modeled the um, the head movements of a mouse. Uh, we did this using uh, recordings of the movements of real mice, uh, like this one. Uh, this is a two-dimensional plot of uh, just a mouse sort of wandering around. Uh, sometimes it pauses for a little while. Um, and so, we, and we have, this is two dimensions, but we had, uh, we had six dimensions. We had, uh, you know, the horizontal movement and also the, the vertical uh, position and uh, tilting in uh, three different 
uh, degrees of freedom. You know, so we had a, a full, uh, um, <clears throat> complete information about sort of the, what the mouse's uh, skull and, uh, and eyes were, were doing in space. Uh, and we developed a statistical model uh, of this mo motion. Uh, and so now we have the model and we can generate uh, random, but uh, you know, fairly realistic trajectories uh, that are more or less you know, to, to uh, drive a virtual mouse through the virtual meadow environment that are more or less realistic uh, in, in terms of what a mouse would, would actually do. And this gives us videos uh, that, that are more or less realistic in terms of what a mouse would, uh, would actually see in, in real life. <clears throat> so we've trained MouseNet now with these videos. Uh, and this seems to result in a strong correspondence uh, between mouse net activity and brain activity and mouse brain activity. Uh, so these, are, these numbers, uh, there are a lot of them and I won't go through them all, but the basic idea is that uh, these are different uh, areas of real mouse brain uh, from, uh, you know, we have recordings from all these areas. <clears throat> uh, these are areas uh, of the model. Uh, and these numbers indicate, uh, you know, how similar uh, one is to the other. Uh, so a zero, uh, these low numbers that are close to zero, that means the, the model has basically nothing in common with the, the real mouse brain uh, for those cases. Uh, numbers that are close to one mean that the model is as similar to a mouse brain uh, as one mouse brain is to another mouse brain. Uh, so the fact that some of them are a little bit higher than one isn't significant, that just, uh, that's just a sort of random, uh, random noise. Uh, but there, a lot of these numbers are pretty high. Uh, so these are, these are strong correspondences. I think the strongest correspondences uh, that uh, that we have right now, um, not not just we, but I think uh, I think uh, that anyone has right now. Um, so there, it's not perfect, obviously, and and uh, we have some uh, next steps in mind. Uh, but uh, the interesting thing is that just by giving the network more realistic experience, uh, we get a closer correspondence, uh, you know, between its internal processing steps and and those of the of the real animal. Uh, and if you think about it, the um, uh, the the life experience of deep networks is bizarre. Uh, you know, if you, you know, training a deep network is sort of analogous. If it, if it was a human, it'd be you know locking them in a dark room at birth and only giving them you know one very specific kind of information. Uh, so that person's uh, brain activity would also be pretty weird. Uh, so uh, you know, it may be that if we just give uh, somehow deep networks more realistic experiences, then their internal processing, their internal processing steps, and their internal activity, and possibly their decisions uh, may become more realistic. Um, I hope we can apply, uh, we can take a step uh, toward applying this to, to human vision uh, at some point. Uh, because I'm in an engineering department, uh, at some point we built a, a robot. Um, and so this, this is our, our robot. It is uh, uniquely uh, capable of, of uh, sort of human-like visual motor or, or ocular motor uh, behavior, uh, including you know, rapid saccade uh, speeds and so on. Uh, so I, I, uh, I'm hoping in the future we can collect, uh, you know, realistic, uh, more realistic human perspective uh, video that we can use as inputs to train deep networks uh, to have visual experience that's uh, a little bit more similar to, to uh, uh, sort of normal human visual experience. And that, and uh, it's, it's uh, we'll see, but that may affect uh, how they process information. <clears throat> uh, we've also done some work to incorporate, uh, you know, uh, biologically motivated models of, of uh, neural microcircuits in the brain uh, into deep networks. Uh, this example is, uh, this is a network that is uh, thought to underlie uh, the phenomena of, of contour integration in the visual cortex. Uh, so in the, in the primary visual cortex, uh, lots of neurons are, are responsive to little tiny edges in, in a little part of the visual field. Uh, they tend to respond uh, more strongly, about twice as strong, strongly. Uh, if the if their their little edge that they can see is part of a longer contour, uh, so that phenomenon is called contour integration. Uh, this is a, a model of a of a circuit, a sort of more detailed biological circuit that is uh, uh, thought to um, thought to uh, mediate that response, and it involves lots of uh, local lateral connections. Uh, so we embedded this uh, this model into a deep network. Uh, we trained it to do various things. Uh, here's an example. So we gave it natural images. And we give it, uh, we put sort of two targets in the natural image and then ask the network to report whether, uh, whether the two targets were on the same contour or not. Uh, so in this case, they are. Uh, they're, they're both on this contour that is the outline of the car. Uh, and the network did that well. Uh, and then when we looked at the internal responses of the network, uh, we found that they closely matched uh, the internal responses of the brain uh, using measures that are thought to be important uh, and relevant to contour integration. 
Um, so in this case, I, I'm not sure uh, what this is actually um, useful for. Um, so there was an idea about what it was useful for in the literature. I think uh, in the process of doing this project, we discovered that probably isn't right. Um, it may be that um, you know this this kind of thing could help with uh, sort of you know changing the the bias of, of deep networks to uh, uh, to pay more attention to uh, to shape than texture. Uh, it might help with resisting adversarial attacks. Uh, if it does those things, I don't think it'll do it them in a straightforward way. Uh, so we have a lot more work uh, to uh, to sort of get to the point of of knowing how to apply this result. <clears throat> uh, okay, so. Just a, a few words about what we can potentially gain by reducing the differences between deep networks in the brain. <clears throat> um, there are a couple of directions we can we can uh, uh, we can we can uh, attempt to uh, take this in. Um, one is the, on a, at, a, at a small scale, uh, we can incorporate more realistic models of neurons and microcircuits uh, into deep networks. And this might help to sort of uh, address a range of a certain range of limitations of deep networks. Uh, these are all speculations on my part, so I don't want to dwell on them. Um, we can also work at the large scale and try to incorporate more brain, uh, including uh, prefrontal areas, potentially, and subcortical areas. Uh, and that might help uh, sort of address a different range of, uh, of weaknesses of deep networks. Um, these again are, are speculations. We don't know it until we try. Um, unfortunately, we can't really look at a limitation of deep networks and know exactly uh, what to take from the brain and to fix it. Um, but I, I still, I think we have to at least try. Uh, so we should at least uh, sort of consider what we de need uh, deep networks to do differently or to do better, uh, and try to make education educated guesses about uh, what we can take from the brain to uh, potentially help with that. Um, okay, so I'm at the end. Uh, to summarize uh, the main points from today, uh, deep networks learn by minimizing a cost that is based on training examples. And if all goes well, they learn to generalize from those examples. Uh, there are substantial similarities and also substantial differences between deep networks in the brain at every level of organization. Uh, and the, uh, I think so each, each kind of system uh, can, I think, shed light on the other. Um, finally, one line of ongoing research uh, seeks to find out which differences are important and potentially reduce them. Uh, so I, th I think I've used as much time as I should. I do want to, I understand the talks being recorded, so I want to flip through the references in case anyone wants to uh, go back and find them. Okay, so that's done. And I'll just land here and uh, take questions. Thanks, Brian. That was really great. That's probably, well, without a doubt, that's the most clear explanation of this whole subject I've ever had in my life, oh, because it's wonderful. It, it's, a, it's a big convoluted mess. And I really appreciate the fact you tried to take it back for us. I, I, I'm sitting here thinking of about 10 different examples of areas within which medicine that are way less complicated than chest x-rays that you could apply these logic things to um, uh, in order to facilitate the care that we provide to patients, because, you know, a lot of what we do requires a, a certain amount of training, um, but a lot of experience, but there's only a small range of output variables. So, you know, for example, I think about, I look at complete blood cell counts every single day. That's my job. Uh, and, and, it, it, it's not like there's a thousand different outputs and it's not like there's a thousand different inputs. It would be, I think, relative, no, not, nothing in this field sounds relatively easy, but it strikes me that there'd be a great way of just simply automating the, the uh, here's, your, here's your complete blood cell count and here's the range of possible outcomes and actually making people's lives a lot more, uh, physicians' lives a lot easier. Um, uh, I, we have a couple of questions uh, here. Um, so one that I don't understand from Connor Judge are deep, Reinf our deep reinforcement meteors. I don't know what I don't know what he's trying to say. Maybe Connor, you could re-enter that hmm. uh, into the chat. Do you understand that, Brian? Uh, I, I don't understand the meteors part actually. Uh, okay. is that, it may, maybe um, uh, the, the field is large, and I, I may have missed a, a branch of it, but I, I don't know that. Yeah. Well, let's see if we re-enter it. So, um, two questions in the in the question and answer uh, thing. So, first of all, Imran Satya said I'd like to really watch it again, and we will. Um, Brian has provided us with. Uh, permission to, to uh, put it on the on the YouTube channels, it will be. So I, I actually texted Imran during the course of your talk about this. And Imran said, I have a, Imran's area of expertise is in cough. Um, so, you know, there's a, there's a group of people who have chronic coughs and it's difficult to sort out what they're due to. And it can be quite disabling 
Um, I say this is someone who got a cough from an ACE inhibitor and it was really quite disruptive. Uh, Imran, I have audio, some audio recordings of coughs, around 15,000 cough sounds. Um, and he wondered whether or not you could actually use this to help to begin to understand how to interpret um, uh, the sounds and the potential association between the sounds and different diagnoses. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, that's a, that's a, yeah, I mean, so that, that might be, um, <clears throat> if you have enough examples and, and, you, and you have uh, correct diagnoses, then, then um, you could, uh, you know, uh, you, you need a large number of examples, but you could train in deep networks to sort of try to uh, try to predict the diagnoses, and then you can also sometimes work backwards and figure out what it was about the uh, what it was about the input that led to the diagnosis. You know, that that's an area uh, that isn't. Uh, um, there's been a lot of excitement about that uh, over the last few years, and, and uh, some disappointments too. Uh, but it's at least a, a, a direction that can be investigated. Yeah, I, I fear that physicians are good at defending their turf and we're smart, so we can think of tactical reasons for doing it. I, um, and, and so when I, when I hear about AI in the context of medicine, it's often framed in the context of the whale turtle discussion that you had. Not, not, so it, it, you know, we're looking for reasons to shoot it down, not to promote it. And I, I, we need yeah. to get beyond that because you know, that, it, that this is, we should see this as a tool to make our lives better, faster, stronger, and to improve the care of patients, not as a threat to our our uh, our position and our income. Because we can, you know, with with it correctly applied, I suspect we can do more. Right. That's yeah. That's my impression too. I think there's a lot of potential. I mean, they, uh, shooting things should be shot down if if they can be. Uh, I, I don't think uh, I don't object to that. Uh, it's but I, I don't think that there's any threat to uh, sort of uh, physicians' livelihood. I think I think. Uh, you know, these should be tools that are used to. Hello. It's much better than, than I would, um, but I, I don't think I don't think it's uh, I don't think it should be viewed as a threat. I don't think there's a. Uh, any thought of uh, physicians sort of being replaced by any of these things. Well, I mean, okay, so that idea has come up repeatedly, but I, I don't think it's correct. Yeah, that's I don't think it's, you know, it, it, certain components of what we do might be changed, but I don't think it's gonna replace us because uh, it doesn't, it, it's nowhere near yet having the kind of breadth of experience of a human. And also patients would rather talk to a human than a computer in most cases, I suspect, although yeah. some would not. Just, uh, so there are some more questions here. So uh, uh, Connor Judge has retyped his thing, are deep reinforcement networks the way forward for using AI in decision making in medicine. Uh, um, well, um, that that's possible. I mean, yeah, the, the, the reinforcement. I mean, re, I didn't talk about reinforcement learning. So the, the uh, reinforcement learning works differently. It works by uh, by um, uh, sort of the, you know the network would would experiment with uh, with an action uh, and then. Uh, would, uh, would learn to make uh, better decisions about how to act in a, in a you know, in a sort of, uh, in some kind of a uh, environment uh, or decision space uh, over time uh, based on uh, different signals, which are just, uh, you know, the degree of success of, of a chain of actions. Uh, so that's a different way of approaching problems. Uh, and uh, I think it, it's, uh, I mean, you could, um, I suppose that that's a uh, more analogous to. I mean, you, you could have an agent then that is sort of more analogous to, to the way a, a physician, um, uh, you know, chooses to make decisions. Uh, it's not the only way forward. I mean, you could also um, you could also have a, a deep network that just mimics uh, that learns to uh, to mimic the decisions that um, that the you know, expert uh, physicians have, have made in the past. Uh, but I, I think it's part of the, certainly part of the story. Uh, Stephen Wong, who's uh, one of our um computer guys uh, and physician and general internist has written, can you generally say what minimum amount of data, and I don't think he's looking very granularly, is required to train a deep network? For example, how many labeled chest x-rays would be required to get a SOTA result? Uh, I don't know the numbers. Yeah, the, um, so so the, uh, the general, so one, one thing is that um, the, if you don't have enough data, uh, so the, the more, more data is always better. Uh, there's always a gap between how well the, the deep network does with the examples you give it and how well it's going to do with the other examples it hasn't seen yet. Uh, so that, that gap uh, is always there, but it goes down, you know, gradually, gradually as you, as you uh, use more data. Uh, and it's, a, you know, you might get a, a small incremental improvement uh, if, you, if you have sort of twice the data. Uh, so that there's no limit. I mean, the, the more data, much more data is, is, uh, is always better. 
um, state of the art on chest X-rays. Uh, I don't recall. Uh, that's um, uh, I, I would think. Um, yeah, I, I don't recall. There, there are a lot of uh, recent studies, um, and I, I, I don't. It isn't worth that I have done myself, so I don't know the numbers. I would think uh, in the. I would think in the many tens of thousands, uh, but it uh, hundreds of thousands. But I, I'm not sure. Yeah, that sounds like an incredibly unbelievable data set, but it's actually relatively easy to get nowadays because we have these enormous electronic medical records where we would have hundreds of thousands of images stored with hundreds of thousands of interpretations. So yep. it's actually not complicated. You have to obviously the, the data sharing and all that's going to be complicated. But in reality, getting that amount of data is actually not doesn't require any new exploration because it's housed at HHS here in town is about to go to uh, a giant electronic medical record called Epic. St. Joe's has been on Epic for a few years. You know, every single chest X-ray that we've done in the last, since we had implemented Epic here at St. Joe's is not the interpretation, but all the images are stored. It would be relatively straightforward to actually get that data and use it for these models. Um, one of the attendees has said, uh, just as a comment, my observation has been more, the more technology we use, the higher the costs have been for maintaining the technology, personnel, et cetera. And I think that's completely true. Although I, I will say that um, certainly have practice practicing at both HHS and St. Joe's. Although the electronic medical record we have now is way more complicated at St. Joe's, it also provides way better care. So, you know, sometimes things are just more expensive to get better care. I think ultimately though, you know, if you had a properly implemented AI solution that was facilitating the work of physicians or pharmacists or nurses, it should be cost saving, I would think. Um, another question here is, is there work in the ML field looking at unsupervised classification to augment human worker decisions? Um, <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Unsupervised learning is another thing that I didn't talk about at all. Although that's a that's um, we, uh, we that's we did actually use unsupervised learning in that uh, most training uh, study that I, I, I talked about. Uh, but that's um, uh, so I mean the the uh, the way that works is that uh, yeah, there are different variations of it. But yeah, you train the network without labels, uh, and so the network's uh, you know learning to. Uh, to sort of um, you know uh, reorganize the the inputs almost without without having a, a correct answer. Uh, one way to do that is to you know to get the network to uh, uh, well I guess a, a video uh, a video example would be uh, would be intuitive. Uh, so you could you can train networks to uh, to produce um, you know, give it a, a video and and uh, and uh, make it predict sort of different frames of the video from other frames. Uh, so that that doesn't require a label. It's just sort of requires a bunch of inputs. Uh, and the advantage of that, of course, is that there are many more uh, sort of you know data points uh, than there are labels. Um, you know, it, 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 going back to videos, I guess there's all of YouTube, uh, for example, to to sort of provide uh, videos to uh, uh, to a deep network um, that that uh, whereas labeling those uh, as you know with uh, information about what they contain would would uh, be an enormous task. Um, so I, I think that's that's generally speaking the role of uh, unsupervised learning, just to to make use of uh, uh, much larger amounts of data. And then uh, probably the last question, just looking at the time, um, for applied ML solutions, do you have a sense of the necessary technical HR infrastructure that would be required to maintain quality? Uh, okay, that's a good question. That's not something I've thought about. Um, let, me, let me pause for a minute. <clears throat> um, so, okay, so to apply, um, apply an ML solution. So a lot of the work in developing an ML solution is, you know, all the training, all, all the, I mean, that's very computationally intensive and requires uh, different expertise. Uh, once a network is trained, um, it's not much trouble to run it. Um, so you, you really just need a te technical infrastructure for um, uh, for sort of running some code uh, that, that, you know, if, if it's been developed well, it, it wouldn't be uh, sort of more difficult to do than, uh, than you know, any other code. Uh, the difference, Probably the main difference is that to get an answer quickly, uh, you have to run uh, these things on different hardware. Uh, usually, they, they require uh, something like a, a graphical processing unit, uh, which is uh, you know a different and you know not a, not it, you know it, it, most computers either don't have them or they're very small. Uh, so usually, uh, deep networks run on uh, and more specialized uh, computers that have uh, better GPUs. Um, so I mean, you'd need some kind of an infrastructure. Uh, you, you know, you have to send things off to the cloud. There are a lot of uh, uh, cloud resources uh, that can that can run these things, or uh, you would need additional infrastructure to sort of you know a, a different uh, different kinds of servers. I suppose if you're if you're in a hospital, uh, you might have a you know a, a GPU server as well as uh, you know all the other servers that you would uh, normally have. So it, you might be looking at sort of a, a a little bit of additional training or 
uh, maybe one or two extra hires in a IT department in a, in a large hospital rather than something really revolutionary, I would think. But it's not something I've thought about uh, in a lot of detail or ever met before, actually. Excellent. Okay. Well, we should, uh, th uh, we should probably end. It's nine o'clock. Uh, let's just like, thank Dr. Tripp for a really clear, excellent, outstanding. I'm going to encourage people to watch this because they might have been scared off by the title, but they, everybody should watch it because it's directly relevant. I know that there's a couple of links we'll make between some of our faculty members and you about areas that could be of mutual interest and potentially student projects. Actually, I've got a couple of ideas for student projects that come directly out of this. So I'd like to thank sure. you for this. Uh, I look forward to rounds next week and my uh, rounds will return in one month. And I wish everybody a uh, great day. And I'd like to thank Dr. Tripp again for our extremely clear, lucid presentation about a very difficult topic. So thank you very much. Thank you. Bye now. Bye-bye.